Welcome to the Maine Science Podcast. I'm Kate Dickerson. Today's episode is a conversation I had with Eric Ferguson, who's an assistant professor in the New England School of Communications at Husson University. Eric is a musician and audio engineer by training, so he comes to science as someone who uses it, is fascinated by it, and who wants to make sure his students understand it within the context of the audio classes that he teaches. Eric has presented at many festivals over the years, and every single time has been a great session. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Eric, welcome to the Main Science Podcast. I am delighted to have you. You're one of my favorite translators, interpreters of sound into science. But before I let you get into that, I would love to know your background, kind of how you got interested in audio engineering and sound, and then how you've connected that with, I assume, what has been a longtime science interest as well. Yeah, I mean, I laugh at myself every time I receive an email from you or an invite to present at the MSF because I don't really see myself as a scientist. That is not my background whatsoever. I'm a musician and I came to it from the music world. And I think this is a longer conversation, but I think we have a problem in our country in education and we tend to divide people into these categories of science and music and art. Well, let's not talk about all that, but like a lot of people, I through high school, I sort of had great fear of math, didn't really see its place in my life. I had a couple of really great science teachers in high school, or at least one remarkable teacher, but for the most part, all my effort was focused on music and audio. So I kind of ignored science my whole life. But I, I grew up in Northern California on the coast in the Redwoods, and there's a lot of science there, marine biology and li- growing up in the Redwoods, it's a lot of beauty. So I was always kind of aware of that. I think I had a few good science teachers. My father's an educator, but I didn't really think science was for me in any way. It was just music. I did audio. That's always been my passion to recording, live sound. Went to community college in Northern California. Then I went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Went and got a bachelor's degree in music production and engineering, making records. That's a great school. Really cool. This was in the mid 90s. I had loved audio always. So as early as age five, I was taking apart tape machines. So this would be in the late seventies, doing everything I could to play with tape machines. And in the eighties, as an elementary student in high school, I would always doing anything having to do with sound and electronics and audio, I would mess with. So my passion comes from music originally and then goes into audio. And then science emerges as I get a little older. After my bachelor's degree, I moved to Los Angeles and worked in recording studios which was a lot of fun and kind of crazy and also very difficult. And from there, I went freelance in Los Angeles, worked on a bunch of different records. I started doing live sound, which I'd done when I was in high school, but I kind of hadn't touched for a long time, maybe 10 years off. And then started doing some touring. I worked with an artist named Lee Rittenauer, went all around the world doing live sound. And that was a lot of fun, uh, challenging as well. Everything fun is also challenging. And then I was at age 35, realized I didn't want to just be freelance and the lack of stability and kind of wanting to get out of Los Angeles. I grew up in a place where Los Angeles was never... In Northern California, we don't like Southern California, let's put it that way. And so I never really felt at home in Southern California and I wanted to get out of there and went to grad school in music again. So got a master's in, oddly enough, Afro-Cuban music, Afro-Latin music. But that being 35 and being a non-traditional student in college, and it was right during the Great Recession, right? 2008, 2009, in that area. It was a great time to not be working. It was a really good time to be in grad school. And I just absolutely loved being in school again. And from that kind of more adult perspective, that's when I kind of everything sort of shifted in my head. I'd always been leaning towards audio education. I had magazine articles and I've always loved testing and comparison. Like audio has a lot of room for science within it in a, in a more practical manner. There's You have two microphones. How do they sound? How do you compare? How do you find a way to double blind test them and come up with real objective opinions about something that's truly subjective? And in the recording studio and in live, in live productions, I've always had that mindset. So when I got to grad school, it kind of gelled. It was like, I do like the more formal side of this. And so grad school was a vehicle to teach, started doing community college teaching, and then got a job offer to move to Maine and work for Husson. And immediately my classes, I structured them in such a way that I could explore and kind of encourage the students to explore the more scientific side of audio while still doing the hands-on practical and still doing the artistic 
side as well. I kind of see it as a triangle where you've got art on one side and practical, hands-on, vocational, and math and science on the other. And any one activity, any one moment in time, you're somewhere between those three realities and what you're doing. And so I'm not a scientist. I'm a musician and an audio engineer who really likes science a lot and thinks it's fantastic. And I try to apply that passion for science. I try to intermix it with my passion for music and actually just making concerts and records together. So while I appreciate you saying you're not a scientist, and I can totally agree that the absolute definition of a scientist you do not slot into, nor do I. Having said that, having seen you present and how I'm going to imagine you teach your classes, you not only have a great appreciation of science and how it impacts your actual career, you know, the work that you chose to do, but you are connecting the dots to that and you're using science all the time either through your teaching or figuring out, oh, how do I do this microphone? How does this work? All these different bits and pieces. The different presentations you've given at the festival have been so cool. Kind of, you know, like, don't blame the sound guy. It's the building itself. And we are working with deeply flawed starting point, right? Things like that. I love so many things about what you said. Number one, that we have the artificially built up silos between art and science and application that only hurts us. And I love that you're bringing in the passion I want to know, when did you figure out that the way you approached music involved thinking about it from what I would call a scientific perspective? i betting it's before grad school, right? But it had yeah. to have been before that. Well, you know, and I can look back, you know, as a middle-aged perspective and certainly as an educator now, I can look back and I can see the roots earlier. Music you can attack from so many different ways. There are a lot of people that play music from a purely instinctual manner. And there's people that attack music from a very prescribed manner. I'm somewhere in the middle on that. I play jazz, I improv. I can read music, but I like the freedom of not always playing music that you have to read. But I look back at my own learning process, and it is pretty objective. I like concrete structures. I like scaffolds that I can hang in my musical playing and my choices on. And I can look back, and I've, I think I've always liked organizing things. And I think the scientific process is very much, I mean, obviously it's about questions of Pat, it's questioning why something works and keep drilling at it until you get an answer. But it is very much also about organizing information and trying to find a path through it to something somewhat objective. And music's an interesting thing because it can be purely subjective. And I have worked with a lot of musicians over the years that live in that ether of nothing pinned down. And that has been difficult for me at different points in my career to work with people when I'm objective and they're saying, hey, I want this to sound more blue. And you're like, don't, that's, the sound doesn't sound blue. Like, what do you mean? And so I think I've always been in that path towards being more objective. I did have an really interesting comment on a student eval a few years ago. It was quite a ways ago. It was probably like five years ago where a student was talking about a particular course I was teaching. And the student said, Eric's incredibly objective doesn't like there to be variation in the truth. So this is a good class for him to teach. And I don't know if it was a compliment or a criticism. I think it was both at the same time, but it was an interesting way of saying, hey, I'm glad you're teaching electronics class because this is a class that doesn't have as much art in it. But I like to think I'm able to dance between the left and right brain. Although I have a tendency to want to organize and use the scientific method and attack artistic questions with logic, I can close my eyes and instinctually choose a color for art when necessary. And life is long enough for us to be more than just a scientist or more than just an artist. We can be both. I feel like I should be saying amen after that. Um, <laughs> I'm curious if you still have trepidation with math, only because the number of things you have mentioned with music, including jazz, I know so many mathematicians, physicists, people who really think about the world through numbers who are mm -hmm. deeply musical. And it seems to me you're coming at it from the other side. And I'm curious if that has helped you rethink how you think about math. I am very different with math now. And I just this morning had a meeting with my dean and we're talking about professional development and what I'm going to do for the next year and what kind of scholarship and all that. And Oddly enough, I want to take math classes because I completely missed it in high school. I mean, you know, you're 15 years old, music, girls, and making things loud. Those are the three things I wanted to do. That's what I was obsessed with when I was 15, 16 years old. Math was not 
what I wanted to do. I remember having a math teacher in, in high school and I'm, I'm like, why? I asked him, you know, being that snotty, you know, 16 year old, like, why are we doing this? And he said, because from his perspective, you do math to do math. Kind of like I do music to do music, right? But his perspective was math is a reward in itself. I didn't understand that. And I've had long conversations with my wife, who's an educator, about we don't apply math in school often. You just do these extended equations, but you don't realize that these equations could describe something really cool if you chose to, not just two people in a train passing each other and what's the relative velocity, like not just weird, boring things like that, but cool things like how a violin string vibrates. So I didn't like math and it was just difficult. And I, maybe I was lazy and just distracted. But as I got older, audio obviously is a science. They do make fun of us. They say that audio engineering is not a real engineer, is not a real form of engineering. We hear that a lot, actually. It's kind of a joke. Mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and chemical engineering and audio engineering. But we are, as I got older, and especially since I became an educator, I really dug into the math side of it. And it's fascinating because what I've learned is math is just another language to describe the physical world. There are times when you're trying to communicate an idea, in my case to a student, how something works and why something is the way it is. And there are times when explaining it in prose and language is the best way to do it. And there are times when describing it with a picture is the best way. And there are times, you know, all these different modalities. And then there's a time where you do it with math and it's just simply the best way to explain something. And I feel that as, as an educator, I've learned that I'm missing that third way, that math form of being able, a complex equation and how things interact in a mechanical system. Now, ironically, I teach math. It's in about half of my classes. I have classes that have math every week. And it's cool stuff. I think it's cool. You know, it's Ohm's law and electronics and acoustics and how the decibel works and very practical things. And I'm always trying to find a way to connect to the students going, you can go make records without learning math. You do not need to know math. But if you learn math, you will open your doors to understanding your craft at a higher level. So encouraging them to not be afraid of it. So I'm no longer afraid of it. The problem is, is I don't speak it very well. So I have to kind of go back in time and go back 25 plus years and now do algebra because it's a vehicle to understand what's going on. So you ask a really interesting question, and I've spent a lot of my my adult life thinking about math and how I kind of missed it. If I had worked harder in high school on it and learned it, maybe I would be able to understand it and apply it better now without having to go back. I don't know. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I can go on a tangent here or side. It is not often taught in a way that is engaging for the vast majority of people. You know, I mean, yep. you know that my husband's a physicist, so math for him is absolutely a tool. But my son is a graduate student in math, and that's his number one complaint. When you said you see the beauty, it represents things. I swear he sees it in his head what the formula means. Like he sees the visual mm-hmm. application. But his long-term complaint has always been that math, when it's taught in school, is often taught without any of the interesting beauty that's behind it. You know, he's a TA, so he's teaching, so he will try to connect the dots as much as a young graduate student can. But it's interesting that you have realized, you know, I'm not sure if you paid attention, it would have made a whole lot of difference because it may not have been taught in a way that would have connected anyway. Right. I I, Probably not. I was a teenage boy, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what you just said about it being disconnected. I mean, I keep going using the musical connection here, musical metaphor, but it'd be like doing scales all the time and never playing music. You know, you could sit in your room and go, bleh, 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 and get really fast at scales. And that's how our math, at least my experience in the 1980s, that's what math was like. You just do equations, you do equations, you do equations. So you're learning the muscle memory to be able to move on to do fancier and, and greater equations. But what happens in at least in my experience in our country, when you get to a certain level of math, you're done and you never actually use it for anything. And then uh, people can't balance their checkbook or figure out their gas mileage. Demystified it enough that they dive in? No, I'm not there yet. Great thing about changing careers at 35 and becoming an educator, you realize there's a whole lot more to learn in your new career. And so pedagogy is fascinating. And I've been teaching, you know, 10, 12 years now and I'm getting better at it. But I, I am not figured out how to teach math in a way where I can impart my passion towards the decibel to them yet. They're afraid of it. 
So you're hitting a, a sore spot. I need to find a way to, to kind of share the love of it. And I don't know yet. They, they too have been brought up in a math environment that has not been as positive as it could have been. So I don't know of that. I don't have that answer. I know there are some wonderful math educators out there and they probably might be able to share with me some, some techniques. And part of it is because when I first started teaching, 10 years ago wasn't that long ago in my time. And I was afraid of math when I was first teaching it. So it's not even been until really the last few years that I'm starting to see the equation, something simple for me, an Ohm's law equation, current and voltage and resistance and how they interact. I'm starting to see that equation for what it means, not my eyes getting all googly eyed when I see math on a piece of paper. So I'm just now starting to love it and, and feel intuitive with it. So I now need to find a way to bring that to the students in a way that they don't hate. So I don't know. I'm saying, no, I don't have the answer. I don't think there's any one answer. I do think the educators that I've enjoyed talking to the most and who have impressed me the most are the ones who realize that they still have ways to both better understand what they're teaching and how to get it across in a way that students understand. So it's such an iterative process, right? It's never right. figured out at all. And it's certainly never figured out in the first five years that you're teaching something. Yeah. I remember when I first started teaching this, it's going to take five years before your class is good. And I, I just didn't believe that. I was like, no, it'll be good within a semester or so. <laughs> they were right. So I'm going to circle back really quickly. You said audio engineers, people mock you. You get jokes about that. Yeah. I'm slightly offended on your behalf. I think, why is that? Yeah. I remember being in a classic kind of cocktail party in Los Angeles and I met some people and was trying to be friendly and I'm like, what do you do? I'm a mechanical engineer. There were two engineers sitting on a couch. And they said, what do you do? I was like, well, I'm an audio engineer. And they laughed at me. You know, 50, 60 years ago, audio engineers wore lab coats. I think that's why I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah, that's where it came from. And back then, audio engineers built things. A degree in electrical engineering was kind of how you got into it. Back in the old days, a lot of people came out of World War II. And they were electronics experts. It's changed a lot. The audio engineering business is very rock and roll. We're a bunch of tattooed misfits. And manufacturing has gotten a lot more turnkey. People don't make consoles, recording consoles for themselves anymore. They buy them very complex and digital and it's all software. So the practitioners are not the designers as much as they may have been 50 years ago. So I don't know. Is it really an engineering? You talk about defining science. It, what, defining engineering is audio engineering engineering. I don't know. And we are paid a lot less. That's definitely. Anything in the arts gets paid considerably less than it should be. The audio engineering is generally in the arts, although there are a lot of different types of audio engineers, and many of us are scientists. They go through the scientific process or the and certainly the engineering process where they build things. And I use as much hard science as I possibly can in the classroom. We're not accredited. That's another difference too. I think a lot of the engineering trades have significant entry requirements. In ours, you can go to a Votech school for six months and have a certificate in audio engineering. So it's a very different thing than civil engineering, mechanical engineering, those sorts of things. When you first started back in the day, was it all analog? Was it starting to become digital? Was it a mix? Everything is pretty much digital now, right? Pretty much. I'm just young enough to have experienced the transition. In my formative years in the 1980s, everything was analog. And I, I did everything on cassette and small format, open reel. When I got out of college in 1996 and went to Los Angeles, and I worked in a really big studio, one of the great studios. Not everything, but I would say 99% of the projects were on tape, big two-inch analog recording tape. So I was lucky enough to get those formative experiences in a big studio with the classic microphones and the classic tape machines and all of that. But I was there in Los Angeles when it all changed. And Pro Tools is the kind of dominant digital audio workstation out there. And Pro Tools, while I was in that recording studio for those three years, we just saw started seeing more and more Pro Tools-based sessions. And certainly by the mid-2000s, tape was on the fade out. Tape's a lot more expensive. It's a lot slower. It is a lot less perfect. It's a lot more problematic. A 22 minute long reel of tape in that time was 150 bucks. And now it's more than that, 300 bucks for a roll of tape. If you can find a roll of tape, all the manufacturers are gone. 
You can buy a hard drive that's way larger than that for a fraction of that cost. So digital is just cheaper. It's more reliable. It's easier to transmit. It's easier to cross the internet. It's easier to share with other people to collaborate. When you record something, you play it back, it sounds the same. So there's less skill required to get decent recordings. Some parts we still teach at Huston, we still teach analog audio. You have to. Microphones are still analog. Speakers are still analog. In the recording world, in the music world, there's a lot of romance attached to older technologies. The classic records that everyone respects and loves, you know, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Queen, that's all been, was all done in analog. So the imperfections of those recordings, we all chase after now. So there is a very large, very vibrant vintage gear market where you can find classic gear of any iteration. And it's all very expensive. So we still have at school, you know, very large six, eight foot long analog consoles, because that's what that part of the industry wants. Other parts of the audio production industry, live sound, post-production, post-production and sound for film and TV, those industries don't really care about the allure of classic, noisy, hard to maintain analog gear. Live sound, we want to sell as many seats in the audience, so smaller consoles is better. Consoles that you can lift and put on the truck without 10 people, consoles that are going to work gig after gig after gig that don't need to be maintained and repaired every day. There's a lot of advantages to digital and digital. There's so many more things you can do with it. It's the preferred technology. Are you finding that more students or more kids are interested in audio because it's digital and also because at least it seems to me, there's more of a recognition of all the different ways it's used. It seems to me podcasting has really helped reinvigorate audio fields and audio products for lack of a better word. Yeah, podcasting is big. I, I've actually had a conversation with an incoming freshman who was asking me about podcasting. Nescom has a podcasting class now. We didn't before. It's the same old stuff that Nescom was teaching before. It was radio broadcasting. It was the same content. It's just now we're talking about recording onto a computer and voice only. Does that invigorate the young people? I don't know. As I get older, it's harder for me to see for, through their lens. And the students I have now were all born multiple years after 9-11. <laughs> the record industry, I didn't mention this in my talk a minute ago about seeing technology change. The record industry really changed because of Napster and downloading. And I always wanted to make records. That was my thing. And it got very difficult to work when people stopped buying records. So in the early 2000s in Los Angeles, part of the reason why I got into live sound was Rates were going down and studios were getting smaller. You know, you, digital meant you can record at home, right? Whether it's a podcast or it's a record, you can record on a computer now. It's a lot less romantic to make a record in someone's living room than it is in a cool studio. And so that industry changed. Now, I can lament about all the studios and go, back in my day, we got paid to make records. But the students just look at me cross-eyed and say, okay, Boomer, because they were born 10 years after that happened. So I don't know if they're excited because of podcasting or because of digital. They just, like me, they want to be involved in the music making process. And in many cases, they don't want a nine to five job. A lot of my students are looking for an alternative path through life that doesn't involve a suit and tie and they can be in the art business. So occasionally I have students that are like, I'm really all about this, but most of them don't know exactly what they want to do. It's kind of my job to show them all kinds of different things and maybe find something for them that resonates with them. So are you still playing yourself as a musician? I am. It's changed a lot. I have a seven-year-old and that's taken a lot of time. As a singer, songwriter, guitar player guy, that's kind of gone away. I haven't written a song in a long time. When I was in my teens and twenties, I was, that's what I wanted to be. It was Leonard Cohen, but I still play trumpet a lot. In Bangor, I still play in a community band. I play jazz. And so it's an instrument I learned in elementary school. I still play, which is kind of cool to play an instrument for 40 years. That's kind of cool. So I still play music. It's really important to stay connected to music. If I stop playing music, I don't know what I'll be. Eric, I don't have anything else in particular. I think I said this before, how much I appreciate how much you try to connect the dots between what everyday people are hearing with going to a concert, for example, and then what an engineer like yourself has to do to make it sound good. And the subjective part is really difficult, right? Because everybody hears different parts of it. So it's always fascinating to me, all the juggling that you're doing in your head to try to 
hit all of these different spots. Both you're explaining to a different audience what it is that you do, but then also as you're actually doing the work, I can envision you pushing all these buttons, trying to make things sound as good as possible for the most number of people. So it's really interesting to hear you talk about that. Yeah, it's a beautiful deep hole to go down. Audio never stops being exciting for me. And I keep learning more and more and more and going deeper down that hole and having a bigger appreciation for it. And I think you kind of nailed it there. And I said this in the beginning, like our, we're right in the middle between practical, hands-on. I do a lot of lifting road cases, right? It's very manual labor. Like there's, there's a lot of physicality of like, we're going to make a product, we're making a widget. But there's also this art thing, like beautiful music and making decisions with your eyes closed about how something sounds, you know, whether it should be a minor chord or not a minor chord. I mean, it's very subjective. And then there's the science side, which I find equally exciting. Like, Why does sound travel this way? Or, you know, why did the sound system sound fantastic in last night's venue, but terrible today? And all the physics behind that, it's infinitely complex and fascinating And I'm lucky to have the job I do because I get to talk about all those and kind of thread them together and hopefully not bore the students with it. It's cool. I don't think of myself as a scientist. I wish I was a scientist. That'd be really fun. I think at worst case, we can call you an avid science practitioner. Yes, that'd be good. Science practitioner. I feel that way about music. I never really felt I was a good musician either. And there's so many fantastic musicians out there, but there's room for all of us, right? That's what's really cool about our postmodern world. There is room for all of us to explore these different things in our own time. It's actually on my, I hate the term bucket list, but it's on my bucket list to someday produce an actual academic scientific kind of paper. I would love to be published with something like that to be able to really cross the line between art and, but there's room for it being in the middle too. And I think that's probably where I live. And certainly that's what my students need. They need this kind of comfort zone, the middle where it's all kind of interconnected. Well, your students are lucky. And I think personally, we're lucky to have you in Maine, not just because you're super enthusiastic about what you're doing, you're teaching all these students, but also because we get to periodically hear from you at the science festival and hear about your work. And I always learn something and I always find it so cool. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, MSF, the the festival's great. And the other things you do, the podcast, certainly the main discovery, the museum is great. All right, we hit all three. We can stop right now. We hit them all. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know why our country has a problem, a fear of science in schools and why we're not producing enough people that want to pursue it as a career because it's so fascinating. Well, if there's enough evangelists like you, Eric, and enough people like me who talk to you, hopefully we can make a little dent on that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Main Science Podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on your podcast platform of choice. And please leave a rating and review. It will help more people find us and help spread the word about some of the remarkable people doing science in Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is recorded at Discovery Studios at the Maine Discovery Museum in Bangor, Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is executive produced and hosted by me, Kate Dickerson, and edited and produced by Scott Lozell. The Discover Maine theme was composed and performed by Nick Parker. <laughs>